it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gary Trubel. Dr. Trubel earned his BS in environmental science with an emphasis on microbiology at the University of Arizona and worked for the USDA for two years researching how to use fungi as a biocontrol on crops instead of pesticides. He then did an MS in environmental science and health at the University of Nevada, Reno in the Desert Research Institute, where he researched active bacteria inhabiting the sub-zero temperature Lake Vita brine in Antarctica. Gary finished his studies by earning a PhD in microbiology at The Ohio State University, where he characterized viruses and soils underlying with permafrost and their roles in ecosystem carbon processing. Gary did his postdoc at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in 2018, where he used stable isotope probing combined with metagenomics and viromics to track microbial and viral activity and substrate utilization in various soils. Gary is currently a staff scientist at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he continues to use metaomics combined with other techniques, for example, isotope probing, to characterize viruses, microbes, and virus microbe dynamics. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Trubel. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. So this is such a cool time to go. That was, Graham, that was such a, such a good talk, and I knew I was going to be going after you. Such a great speaker. Um, I think that that was perfect to go right before my talk because it really has us take a step back and think about what are, what are we doing for astrobiology? What are our goals? What do we need to think about? I think a lot of us get bogged down in what an astrobiologist has to be. And, you know, as, as you heard in my background, the way I got into astrobiology is different than other ways that people get into astrobiology. And I would arguably say an astrobiologist is somebody that questions life. Like, what are we doing? Why are we here? What, what is life all about? I think one of my favorite quotes is from a NASA uh, and I, NASA Astrobiology Institute poster where for astrobiology, it says, what is life, where is life, and how do we find it? And that, that's really what it's all about. There's no direct path that you have to take to become an astrobiologist. So here I'm going to give you kind of some vignettes of work that I've been doing, ways that I'm pushing the boundary to really detect and look at life. Um, I arguably think viruses are alive at some points. We have our working definition of life, but there's no set definition. But for instance, when a virus infects a host, it redirects its metabolism and the host only does what the virus wants it to do. So is it the host that's alive or is it the virus that's alive? So I chose soils to go into because they're the most diverse ecosystem. And to really look at detecting our limits for life, we need to be looking in soil ecosystems. Um, so I'll have some shout outs at the end for some astrobiology and astrovirology endeavors that I've done. But I want you to take some time to really learn about viruses and viruses and soils. And please ask questions if you have any at the end. So the first thing I want to point out is that metagenomics and metaomic processes, these are metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, metaproteomics, metametabolomics, there's so many out there have really revolutionized how we look at viruses and just microbiology in general. Um, here's a figure I took from a paper from by Simon Rue in 2019, where in blue and green, you can kind of see our isolates of viruses that we just accumulated over time. But in just such a short span of time, we've shot up the number of viral population genomes that we've gotten in databases so quickly. And we kind of, help you understand that what a metagenome is, the way we're looking at viruses without needing to cultivate them, is that we're taking a sample like soil and we're extracting all the nucleic acid. So for a metagenome, this would be all the DNA from the soil and we're sequencing it. Then we're reconstructing all these genomes. We're also reconstructing the variants that go along with these genomes. So we like to call them population genomes. So this is what I've been pushing is really looking at viruses from soils using metagenomics primarily. So until recently, if you looked at viral studies, they haven't really been in soils. Um, we had some of our first studies in the oceans, and then we had everyone caring about human viruses taken off. And there's nothing wrong with that. I like human viruses, but I specifically focus on viruses that infect microbes, especially bacteria, and we call these bacteriophage. 
So these viruses are host specific. They can only infect bacteria as we know, but there's so much that they can do in the environment. And this is what I'm exploring. And they have the largest diversity of any viruses out there. So what I've done with my time now at LNL, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, is really push soil viromics, a study of just focusing at the virus comportment of viruses in soil. So we've been pushing the, the studies up there. So the problem, why am I shooting for soils and how do soils help with our detection of life? When we take a metagenome, we sequence all the DNA from soil. Less than 2% of our data, we like to call this assembled reads, actually go to viral sequences. Less than 2%. So we're not really seeing viruses in our main way in which we're detecting viruses. And the reason for this is if you look at soil, I have this small area that I zoomed in for you. There's so much going on in soils. You have your plants, your roots, the rhizosphere, here, it's so rich. You have your macrofauna, you have your mesofauna, the microfauna. Then if you zoom in, then you get at your microbes. You have your bacteria, archaea, and if you zoom in even further, now you can see the viruses. So when we're taking this DNA, we're taking all of this DNA. And so the viruses, yes, they're highly abundant. They're the most abundant biological entity out there. But they have these small genomes that get swamped by these large genomes. So I've worked for my PhD and since on really being able to get as much information we can from the tools that we have and then bringing tools together to increase the detection. So the first thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is when I use from a postdoc and now is stable isotope probing to really look at microbes and viruses in ecosystems, but specifically soils. So if we look at microbes, we have bacteria here, they can exist in many different metabolic states when they're in soil or any environment. I'm just gonna keep saying soil. But the majority of them are actually dormant or deceased. And when we take all this DNA, we're looking at this whole community. So we're not actually seeing who's, who's contributing, we're seeing all the members. It's kind of, if we looked at the human population instead of seeing everyone alive now, we saw everyone who was ever on the earth. And for different research questions, we kind of care about what's going on now or who's contributing right now. So in order to bypass this, I'm gonna to talk to you about two different, different versions of isotopes that I use with compounds to look at viruses. So the first one we call heavy water. So you have traditional water, which is H2, uh, around 16, oh, that's the most abundant isotope of oxygen. But we can change that oxygen isotope to 18 oh. This is enriching it. This is less abundant, so when we add this, any organism that uses water, which is everything that's active, because water is a universal substrate for life, it's going to incorporate this heavier oxygen into its DNA or RNA. So we can actually pull that out and we know who is using the water so we know who is active. So with heavy water, we're going to label all active organisms and the viruses that infect them. Another experiment that I'm going to talk to you about is where we can use specific substrates to target certain parts of the community. And so instead of all organisms, in this study, I'm going to use enriched plant biomass. This is where we grow plants with 13 CO2. So the plants will take up the CO2 for photosynthesis. They'll be enriched with 13 C carbon. So the whole plant is now 13 C labeled. So any organism that's munching away and breaking down that carbon is going to become labeled. So I'm going to specifically look at the organisms that are responsible for degrading the plant biomass. But once we have that organism labeled, we then can extract its DNA, and then we can do ultrasonification to separate the DNA, physically separating the DNA based on its density. So in these tubes here, we have our dormant, deceased, or our non-degrading 13C plant biomass DNA up towards the top, and then the one that's enriched with the 13C or the 18O is more dense, so we can physically separate it. We can pull them out separately, and we can sequence them separately. So this is helpful because now we can sequence who is active and who's contributing, but also for comparative reasons, we also know who else is there. And the reason is when we sample an environment, we're taking a snapshot in time. So just because something's active right now doesn't mean it's necessarily active later. And we're still trying to figure out this time scale and this temporal sampling to really understand how the environment and the dynamics are changing. It could be I sample something now, and then a minute later, those are no longer active. This is what we're really trying to figure out. So we take both and then we can compare. 
also by looking at both, we get this nice genetic catalog of everything that's possible in the environment. And this can help other fields such as biotechnology or looking at the health of the soil possibly. Okay, so going into my first paper that I wanna talk about. So this is something that we published last year and it was exciting work. Um, it kind of brought me back to my PhD work where I was working on viruses and permafrost, which is frozen ground. So here we looked at permafrost, which is groundless frozen for two or more consecutive years in Alaska. And what happens is every year, the permafrost has an active layer that seasonally thaws and the microbes become active. And then during the winter, it freezes back up. Now it's currently thought that all the carbon that's leaving the soil, you know, leading to climate change and global warming is from microbes coming from the summer. That's when they're active. That's when they're respiring, releasing CO2. But there's been mounting evidence to suggest that CO2 is leaving during the winter as well. So we really wanted to look at this. So we went and we sampled this peat, which is this highly organic, nutritious soil that just hangs around because it's so cold and the conditions aren't right for microbes to break it down readily. So we took this peat and we simulated winter conditions. So we brought it down to below freezing. We made it anoxic, so there's no oxygen and we incubated it for a full year and we sampled at a half year and then at the end of the full year. From this, we physically extracted the DNA and separated it. And then we sequenced 23 metagenomes. During this time, we also measured carbon dioxide being produced in these bottles. All right, so the key takeaways of what happened here. We realized that there were active viruses and bacteria in the sub-freezing anoxic permafrost soils. And that when we compared who was active to who was not active, the communities were very different. So in this figure, we have these larger pills, which are bacteria, and then we have these hexagons, which represent viruses. If they have numbers and they're larger, they were active. If they're smaller, they were inactive. Now, we don't show you their abundance, but if you look at the pink ones down the bottom, typically when we look at these permafrost soils, these are actinobacteria. These are the most abundant organisms. They just dominate. And if you look, most of them actually were not active. And the ones that were active were our green ones and our yellow ones. So these are our firmicutes and our bacteroidetes. And what's crazy about this is if we had just taken a traditional metagenome, we would have never looked at these organisms. Their abundance is so much lower, we would have ignored them. But they're actually who is there and who's active. So we would have missed the important part of our research. So by adding the stabilized still probing with our metagenomics, we got to see this. We also got to see that while only a small portion of the bacterial community was active, a large portion of our viral activity was active, over 70%. We look into the metabolism of these bacteria, we saw that they had the capabilities for fermentation and for breaking down carbon, okay? So we also know that they respired and produced CO2. So we physically showed that respiration was occurring over winter. So this makes us rethink how we think of the activities of organisms in different environments, that in these sub-freeze environments, there is carbon dioxide coming from, they are active. We were able to link a third of these active viruses to hosts. And when we looked at their genes, the viruses actually carried these genes that when they infect the host, they can make the host use these genes and it can help the host scavenge nutrients to help survive the winter or possibly help them break down other plant biomass. Another thing as we saw is that as the bacterial community shifted over the year, the viral community shifted towards the bacterial community. So we know from previous research that viruses will lyse their host and kind of this kill the winter hypothesis. So they maintain diversity by you have one population that shoots up and the viruses kill it and control it and bring it down. This way it feeds all the other organisms and gives them ability to actually compete. So now we have a more diverse community. And this could be really important for how our Earth is changing with climate change. Okay, now moving into a completely different environment. We're leaving the cold, the frigid, anoxic environment. Now we're moving to the lush Puerto Rican rainforest. And as you can imagine, this is where we're using our 13C. So we have these lush rainforests, which are known to have this high diversity and are critical for storing carbon on our planet. But one thing that a lot of people don't know is that the rainforests have these crazy redox conditions in the soil where you can get this, this 
downpour that just floods the soils. And these microbes are highly diverse here. So what is going on? How are they surviving this? They go through periods where there's oxygen and then no oxygen and they have to be able to respond and survive that. We wanted to know how are they surviving and who's active? Is it, are they constantly dying and other ones are emerging? Are viruses active? And more importantly, how does this redox condition, the switching between oxic and anoxic environment, affect the fate of the organic carbon there? Are we, is it helping store carbon or is it causing a problem releasing this carbon? So we set up a treatment experiment where we had four different treatments. We had oxic the whole time, anoxic the whole time, a high frequency switch every four days, and then a slower frequency shift of four and eight days to mimic rain patterns of the area. So this is where we used a 13C enriched plant biomass and we incubated it with soil over 44 days. And remember, we're not, we're not looking for all active organisms. We're specifically looking at the organisms and viruses that are part of breaking down this plant biomass and the fate of this biomass being released into the atmosphere or stored in the soil. Um, so we were able to maintain this kind of headspace of oxic or anoxic using a nitrogen gas. And then we incubated for 34 days. So here, we also wanted to compare, are we actually getting increased resolution on our viruses and bacteria by teasing apart the active versus the inactive? So we did a comparative study. We took 10 traditional metagenomes, which I call bulk soil metagenomes, and then we had 85 SIP fractionated metagenomes. And this is where we teased apart heavy fractions and light fractions and compared them. So the main takeaway from this is if you think about it in comparison to our Arctic samples, the diversity was so much higher here. We had 64 active, or sorry, 46 active bacteria before. Here we had 326, and that was just looking at the carbon. There was other ones that didn't eat, didn't care about breaking down the plant biomass. And these bacteria span 20 different phyla, so this huge diversity. And we also had 640 viral populations, almost double compared to our last one, and this is just looking at the carbon only. When we compared our SIP fractionated to our traditional metagenomes, we see that we did increase the resolution on our viruses because when we compare them, we got about 7% more viral population, so we increased our diversity that we captured. Now, I want you to focus on this figure here. Let me help you break it down because I know these HEMACs can get crazy. So let's focus on the one on the left. At the top, I have the black ones. These are kind of my bulk samples. And then in blue, I have my control samples. This is just regular plant biomass. And then the red at the bottom, this is the 13 c rich plant biomass. And what I want your eyes to see is if you see white, there's no abundance. That's a viral population that wasn't doing anything. You see some orange, there's a viral population there, it's doing something. You see green, not only is there a viral population there, but it's taking off. It's killing its host, it's redirecting its metabolism, it's influencing the environment. So that's what we care about. I also have zoomed in on the figure on the right, just the active ones, because this is these are the ones we really care about, right? These are the ones that are controlling the carbon right now. So you'll see that in the oxic, we had the most, each line is a viral population. We had the highest diversity of viral populations, and this decreased along the redox gradient. So when it was anoxic and there's less oxygen, there's less viruses. And if you think about it, that makes sense. When you're a virus, when you're taking over your host, you either want to kill it and make more progeny viruses. You're like, oh, my babies. Or you want to lie low in it and you want it to become strong and efficient so it can survive this hard time before you make your babies later. So what you want to do is you want to be able to use efficient earth, the kind of the fastest, the strongest metabolism, arguably, um, is oxygenated metabolism. But then if you look at the anoxic environment, you'll see we have these green ones. Remember I said that was important. These are viruses that are highly abundant. So even though we have less viruses in the anoxic, in the no oxygen soils, they're highly abundant. So we have some special, we have these viruses that were able to feel this niche space that other viruses couldn't. And they're taking off, they're loving it. They're living their life to their fullest, they're happy. So this is actually a paper that we're still developing. And we're really trying to look how are these viruses different? How are they dealing with this metabolism that doesn't require oxygen? And that's going to be critical to look at what genes are using, what they're changing. And our viruses to the bacterial host. We knew which ones were involved with plant biomass, but are they only a 
affecting the plant degradation by killing hosts and preventing them from breaking down the plant biomass? Or are they doing other things? So we surveyed their genomes and we found that they actually encoded genes that when they infect the host, they're helping the host break down the plant biomass. And this is a reoccurring story that we're finding in soils. Typically in, in the oceans, you don't see these glyphosate hydrolases that help break down biomass, but in soils, more and more of these genes that viruses are carrying to help the host. So they're having this role in carbon cycling that we just don't know the whole story on. Okay, I'm moving on to my LDRD work. So at a national lab, you can get research funded and what's called an LDRD. This is lab-directed research and development. And this is something I love about working at a national lab. These are called high-risk, high-reward studies. This would be you, you spitball an idea to a friend and they're like, ooh, that sounds crazy. I feel like it would fail. That's what they want to fund here. They want a high risk, high reward. You dream something big and it's either going to be amazing or you're, you're, it's going to fail, but you're going to learn something from that failure. And that's what I got funded and that's what I've been working on. And that's what I'm going to tell you about right now. Okay. So kind of stepping back, we talked about metagenomes before and I just want to remind you from the metagenomes, we're getting this low resolution on viruses. So I set up this experiment using a grassland soil because there are, we found out recently that they could be super important for carbon storage by having these long roots. So we took a grassland soil and we had four different treatments. We either had our water or we had our heavy water to look at the active ones. And we added, we added phosphate because we thought, you know, viruses use a lot of phosphorus when they make their captives. So we we're wondering if it's critical for infection. So we had some treatments where we added that. We also wanted to know how these viruses changed in the, how they affected the ecosystem and themselves, how they changed over time. So we sampled over the course of a month before we're adding the water and after adding the water. And what's important here, uh, if, you, if you're not from California, like I originally was, and you don't understand this, that the whole summer, there is no rainfall. It's great for tourism, but you would think it sucks for the organisms in the soil. How do they survive? half the year with no water. So they have no water for half the year. And then come to the fall, they have the first rainfall. You get this birch effect. You get water being added and all these organisms come to life. And so much of the carbon is lost after that first rain event because we're now giving substrate to these organisms to reactivate. So this is what I want to study. So we're adding the water here to these dry soils to really see what's going on here. But it wasn't just metagenomics I wanted to do. I spent my whole PhD optimizing methods for what we call viromes or viral targeted metagenomes. And as you can see from the figure here, it's a multi-step process where we take soil, we wash it with different bus buffers, and then we physically separate by size fractionation, typically a 0.2 or 0.5 micron filter, to get things of virus size out of the soil, and then we sequence that. So I can, I'm showing here visually comparing the circles. We get so much more information on the viruses from this virome. We also, funny enough, get information on ultra small bacteria and archaea as well. So it's just, it's a really cool technique. And so the con about this though, is if you just take a virome, you're not necessarily getting all the hosts and less of the ultra small hosts. You kind of want to take both if you want to know, if you want to relate viruses back to the ecosystem level consequences from mitigating their hosts. On top of this, though, we wanted to take a metatranscriptome, and this is going to be looking at all the RNA from the soils. And this is important because there's all these viruses out there that are RNA. Viruses are the only biological entity that we know can have double-stranded and single-stranded DNA or RNA. Some can reverse back and forth between that as well. So we needed to get the RNA as well to look at these viruses. Finally, something that we kind of on here and, and invented some methods for us. We call this eDNA metagenome. So in the past, it's been called ancient DNA, relic DNA, degraded DNA, blah, 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 or environmental DNA or exogenous DNA. So this is just DNA that is in the environment. And I wanted to see, okay, if we have DNA in the environment, what, what's its origin? What's its function? Is it being used in biofilms? Is it coming from organisms dying? Are other organisms eating? Is it a buffet? What's happening? And by taking all these methods together, we can get a better understanding of the whole virus here from all these different components. Okay, so related back to eDNA, 
We've only gotten into a little bit of the data, so it's preliminary, but I wanted to share some of it with you. So in this figure here, I have our time points, the T0s pre-wet up, and then we have one week, two weeks, and three weeks after we added our water. And on the Y scale, we have the log scale, right? So huge changes between the amount of eDNA we're seeing. So at the T0, we have a lot of eDNA. So which means if you're taking a metagenome, you're also seeing DNA, not from inactive organisms, but also not even inactive in organisms at all, just in the environment. So what's going on there? Okay, so it accumulates over the dry summer. This is my leading theory so far as I'm investigating. And then we have this downshift. So what's going on? Okay, well, we added water. Organisms now have this water to use to fuel their metabolism. And this DNA is juicy. They're hungry. These are cheeseburgers or salads if you're a vegetarian. They're loving it. They're like, no, 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 no. So the eDNA is dropping. The microbial populations are increasing. And we see that. We see the number of microbial populations and their abundance increasing. Then we kind of have a level off a bit. And we have viruses killing microbes. So we have the microbial populations dropping. We have a little bit more of eDNA going into the environment. So viruses are contributing to the eDNA in the environment now by killing the host and their necromass going out there. But then we see maybe the community stabilizing, where we have this arms race where viruses are killing micro, bringing the population down. That micro becomes resistant to the virus, so then it can start increasing. So we kind of get this leveling of the eDNA in the environment. And when we actually compare, where is this eDNA coming from? So on this other figure out here, I have our viral populations on the y-axis, and I have our microbial populations on the x-axis. And then the dots represent who does the eDNA belong to? And the majority of it, if you look at our line that I provided for you, actually belongs to the microbes. So they're coming from these microbes that are being killed, or the microbes could be exuding it to build biofilms and survive. Okay, so I want to make sure I have enough time to give everyone questions. But one last thing I wanted to talk about before going into my astrobiology shout outs is I want to talk about other ways besides bioinformatics and omics that you can look at viruses and look at detection of life. So nanosims, which is nanoscale secondary ion mass spectroscopy. This is where we can use a beam to destroy a substrate, a particle, something, and we reconstruct it into a picture. So we've been pushing to be able to look at viruses this way. And what's cool is we can have nanosims on a rover to go somewhere else, and we can actually see things that are alive or that we consider alive. Um, so I have here some TEM images where we've been purifying to look at viruses. So we have this Cyphoviridae. It's a cut of Raleigh. It's a double-stranded DNA bacteriophage that we were able to see with the nanosims and then we are on TEM and then we put on the nanosims. On the top right, we've been able to see these other cool filamentous um, viruses, these really co cool ones. And the specialty about seeing something with an innocence is you can physically see it so you know it's there. It's not just a, a dot or something that we have to infer. You're seeing it, that it's there. But also, we can add in isotopes to actually see if it's active. So here, we use the 13C. So we know where carbon is incorporated in the virus, and we know that the virus is active as well. So you might have heard about the Viking missions in the past. We've come so far since then. So this is exciting stuff to think about for the future. Okay, so my quick shout out is that we really wanted to push viruses in astrobiology and really get astrobiology. You don't have to be someone who studies viruses to get into it. There's no correct or direct path to be an astrobiologist. If you study life in any form, whether it's physics, chemistry, biology, you can become an astrobiologist to care about the questions you're asking. So we did a white paper to increase awareness and funding for viruses, and that's available now if you want to go to the link. And this is really just how to incorporate viruses into astrobiology. And we had questions that we asked. And what was really cool is I got to work with Penny Boston, which was the former head of the NASA Astrobiology Institute, um, Ken Stedman, who is at Portland State University, and my good friend Catherine Bywaters. We also, so that was already published, we also wanted to change our framing and get other people to be excited about astrobiology as well. So the first one is everything viruses, viruses are cool, you should love viruses as well. Our second one, which I have in the bottom, which we're calling viruses as modulators of cellular metabolism. This is specifically how we can use viruses 
for long-term space travel or short-term um, space travel? And what are the effects on human beings, the, uh, viruses, or even on keeping our ecosystem? Viruses infect plants. So how do viruses affect plants in space? Viruses infect algae that we're using to clean up our waste or make food. They also affect us, or if we come back, we need to understand this. Viruses are also really small, and they've been detected even in our clean rooms. So we also have to think about viruses for planetary protection as well. So that's one that we submitted last fall. And so hopefully it's going to be published this year. So just keep an eye out for that. I also wanted to point out that in 2019, NAI funded our Astrovirology Workshop Without Walls. This is a free two-day event that we did spaced out over two parts of the day to really engage the whole world. So I have a map here of everyone that was active during it, but I've had many people from other countries reach out to me that was helpful. So both of them are available on YouTube. You can watch the whole thing, the questions, everything is there. We've tried to organize it into two themes, but everything's about viruses on Earth and the potential for space and how viruses can have all this different nucleic acid. So I implore you to please check it out. Um, email me if you have questions. I'd love to get feedback on it. Hopefully we can do more workshops like that in the future. Uh, the final thing I want to say is we're going to AbsiCon this May. Grandma's talking about how he's going to be there. I'm going to be there as well. Please come see us. Please join our session. We have two amazing speakers, Dr. Rachel Whitaker and Olivia Negro, and we're talking about viruses, everything viruses. And what's cool is at the end of the, comp of the session, we're going to have kind of a town hall with all the speakers to really discuss where the field is going, what are questions you have, how you can in the field, where do we need to push to really get people to start thinking about viruses. Whether you consider them alive or not is semantics. They are integral to life. As far as we know, they've been here since life, if not before life. So when we're looking for life, why not look for the most abundant thing that's related to life, the most abundant biological entity, which are viruses. With that, I just want to acknowledge the diverse teams I'm working with at Berkeley, at JGI, at, uh, Lawrence, um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, we have our science focus area grant that I'm working on. Um, I also want to talk about funding from uh, our LDRD, these high risk, high reward that have really pushed our science and have been foundational for really understanding viruses and all ecosystems. I also would just want to do a land acknowledgement for where our studies are taking place and the people who took care of those lands before we got there and are taking care of them now. So we appreciate that. Um, and then I want to end with a question. So here I have a, a nice diagram that Penny Boston made about, you know, viruses are not considered life sometimes. They're not incorporated into the tree of life because we use a marker gene that viruses don't have. But viruses infect all life. Viruses even infect viruses. So we need to be thinking small and thinking viral. And with that, I'll take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Trubel. That was an amazing speech. Okay, so we have a few questions for you. Um, number one, with such a small proportion of reads mapped to viruses, how do you know of the actual sequences found with low coverage? Well, that is a great question. So let's take a metagenome. And let's say you have 100% of your data. This is the data you get. These are what we're going to call our reads. So less than 2% go to viruses. But if you actually look at a traditional soil metagenome, depending on where it's from and how they're doing it, not all those other reads are going to be used either, right? It, I, I said 2%, less than 2% of the assembled reads. So we have all these, the majority of reads actually not being used because life is so diverse and so complex that we just can't even tease it apart. So then we're just looking at the data that we can assemble, so the data that we are aware of. Okay, so looking at this usable data, how do we know if something's virus or not, if it has low coverage? Well, we need to increase our coverage. So that was why I traditionally pushed for the virome approach and really looking at the viromes. And then you're saying for those one few viruses that we get from meta metagenome, how do we know that those have coverage? Well, that's, that's what's tricky is, in a metagenome, you're also getting host, right? So a virus can be integrated into a host. When it's integrated in a host, if that host is highly abundant, every time its genome is duplicated, the virus's genome is also duplicated. So if the host is highly abundant, the virus is also highly abundant. So when I said less than 2% go to viruses, the ones that do go to viruses go to those highly abundant viruses. 
So we get low diversity, but we get high coverage or relatively high coverage of them. Now, you're right though, it's, it's hard, especially with variants in either a technology or that just exists within populations. How do we know what is and what isn't? So a lot of times we get incomplete genomes where we're just recovering the parts of the genome that have a lot of coverage. Or we use great tools out there. Um, Simon Rue made Veer Sorter, which is one of my favorites, and now there's Veer Sorter too. They really look for hallmark genes or parts that relate to a virus, like strand virus or short um, genes, to really say, hey, this is a virus, and it gives you confidence and rules with that as well. Um, but yeah, we're it to really increase the resolution of viruses, you have to decrease the complexity of the sample. I had tried virums before. I'm now using stable isotope probing. There's so many other methods out there that we can push to really increase our resolution on viruses. There's now single cell genomics. There's microfluidics being used. Arguably, you could use a TEM to try to look at part of a sample. I mean, there, there's so many different ways we can do, and I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question is, has there been any evidence to suggest that there are archaea that associate with viruses in soils? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it seems biased here that I'm like bacteria, bacteria, bacteria. Um, I just want to step back and say, most of the viruses we see in soils are bacteriophage, which are viruses that infect bacteria, and most of them are double-stranded DNA viruses. And if you think about metagenomics and our sequencing, we were set up to look at what we thought of as life. So this is humans, plants, fungi, bacteria. They have double-stranded DNA genomes. So our sequencing technology is set up for that. So it, it's no chance that, it, like, this is why we do it. This is why we have double-stranded DNA viruses, right? This, this is why we can easily see them, or easily. Um, so, there are ways out there which you can start to get a single strain of DNA viruses. I had published some papers that way. We have to really think about when we're prepping our samples for sequencing and think about that single strain of DNA. Or, you know, if, if you're thinking about relic DNA or ancient DNA, the hyaluronic DNA is also usually single stranded. So if you think about them as the same single strain of DNA viruses in line with eDNA, you kind of are going to find methods to help you get that. Finding RNA in environments is really difficult. So there hasn't been a lot of work with metatranscriptomes and I've been trying to push that. Others have as well. Um, this one day we're gonna get an RNA virome to really look at the encapsulated RNA viruses if they are the majority out there. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. If, can you rephrase the question or say it again so I can make sure I answered it? Yeah, just asking about um like archaea associated okay, yeah, viruses. Sorry. I was going off on the tangent. Yeah, no <laughs> so, sorry, everything was set up towards bacteriophage. So for archaea, they also have viruses. But it, what we know about viruses is largely come from isolates, and we can eat more easily grow bacteria compared to archaea. So we also have more isolates on viruses than in fact bacteria, so we know more about them. So I talked about virus disorder before. Well, it looks for enrichment of genes for cotoviralis, which are bacteriophage. So they also push towards archaeal, or sorry, bacterial viruses. We have found some great archaeal viruses. Um, Ken Stedman has done it in hot springs, which are not soils, but you get some cool lemon-shaped ones. Um, we know they exist in soils. There's some previous papers. Um, I'm trying to think of the names right now. There are, there, we know that they're there. Why we don't see them as much, People have said, oh, archaea have more CRISPRs or less CRISPRs. You've heard it both ways. They, they're they less abundant, so viruses don't care about them. I really just think it's it's our sampling. Um, they are there, but we know very little about them, especially in soils. As you probably know that if we're going to find them, it's usually in hot springs or these other aquatic environments. Sorry, I, I hope I could answer that answer your question, but there's not much more I can give you on that. <laughs> yes, definitely. No, thank you. Um, okay, so I have one more question for you. Sure. Would you consider virus to be life's fail-safe against mass extinction, or are there more of an intermediate step that have found a new way to propagate? So let me make sure I got this right. The fail-safe against mass extinction in terms of the virus controlling these populations to make sure everyone else has a fair share. 
Um, so if I think of it in that way, I would say yes and no. I mean, I don't think anything's engineered that way. I think you have a biological entity that is selfish. It wants to replicate. So it goes after the most food. If you had a buffet out, uh, that maybe that's not the best comparison. But because, yeah, I, you, you're you more likely to go where there's resources. So I guess a, a better comparison would be if you knew you had to survive somewhere for three days and we had a beach that was barren or desert land, and then you had a condo here with all the amenities, you would choose a condo with the amenities because you want to make sure you're caring for your progeny, your offspring. You want to make sure they're still going. So viruses, I think, have just evolved to, to kill the most abundant. I don't know if it is a way for nature to control itself. I mean, there's the Gaia hypothesis is, you know, it's self-regulating this, this giant mega ecosystem. Um, and if you want to go down the road, I could agree with you that viruses are doing a good job at keeping diversity, at, at regulating that. Now, what's tricky, though, is they don't do it alone, right? The hosts have to adapt to survive. It was just up to the viruses. They would kill and make a population go extinct, right? And in cases where we have like phage therapy, that's kind of the goal. We're trying to get a population to go extinct. So we're also relying on the host to be able to evolve to outcompete it. So is it the host that's the failsafe that it learned its lesson and it's coming back if we're going to um, personify it? But I, I don't know. And then when it, if I think you're leading to when it comes to humans, that gets more tricky because we metaconjugate. We can think about thinking we're self-aware and we can change our actions. So unlike this microbe that, that has to evolve genetically to survive, we can take stances where we can fend off the virus, right? Where we can stop the thing that's trying to control us. So there's, there's so many different ways. I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but I know what you're thinking. And I, I don't think life is malicious. I think everything is trying to do its best and the virus itself wants to propagate and it wants to keep itself happy. So it's going where the most resources are. Definitely. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Well, that was, again, a great talk by Dr. Trubel.